Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning to you online as well. Back in the book of Romans today. Chapter 8. Talking about, in a way, the church. We're here today because we call ourselves the church. The church is both the visible and invisible. Visible meaning it's the people that are here sitting today in the congregation. They make up the church. They come to a church. Invisible meaning that there are those among us who are true believers and maybe some of those among us who are not true believers. But both of those make up the church that we see before us today. And the church that we have, the church that we come to today, Southside Church, is not an idea of man. This was God's divine plan, God's divine mind to call out a people, to assemble them together, to organize them, to give them governing council being the elders, to give them servants being the deacons, for us to grow, for us to use our gifts and talents to build each other up, as Matt was talking about this morning in the Lord. All of these things come not from us, they come from God. And then the church itself is made up of believers, and those believers also are believers, not because of what we've done, but because of what God has done in us and through us. And so we're standing on a peak today. We're talking about Romans 8, 29 and 30. And last time we were in this passage two weeks ago, we talked about how we are kind of at the 29,000 foot mark of the Everest of Scripture. And today we stand on that precipice with verse 29 and 30. And whenever we look at a passage like this, what we begin to understand is that we owe our entire existence to the sovereign power and pleasure of God and God alone. And in order for us to see the world rightly, in order for us to be the church in the world, in order for us to understand the world, we have to have a right understanding of ourselves. And if we are going to have a right understanding of ourselves, we must have a correct understanding of Romans 8, verse 29 and 30. Because if we miss the point of this passage, everything comes crashing down the mountainside of heresy, doctrinal errancy, gospel ineffectiveness. All of it comes down the slope of missing the point of Romans 8, verse 29 and 30. And I know this not because it's my own idea. I know this from looking at church history. Church history alone shows this. As men, pastors, and teachers began to call into question the true meaning of Romans 8, 29, and 30, they began to fly down that slippery slope. And that's the first step off this peak. And they begin the downward descent that Jonathan Edwards calls the slippery slope to destruction. This is a slippery slope. Because we take God off of his glorious throne. If we do not take it for what it says, understand what it means, and accept the truth as what it is, we take God off his throne and we put him on our couch. Is essentially what we do. We make him more like us in a way that we want to understand him. We just sang this morning, he's holy, 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 right? That's what they sang around his throne in the vision we have in Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy. He is different than us. He's separate than us. He's set apart from us. That means there's going to be truths that we come in contact with in Scripture that we may wrestle with a little bit, but in the end we have to stop and say, God, if this is you, reveal that to me. Have me accept this truth. Because what begins to happen is we begin to look at the gospel, and Romans, 28, Romans 8, verse 29 and 30 is the center of the gospel. We're looking again Behind the curtain, this is from God's perspective. We've been looking at it from man's perspective. This is God's perspective. As we look behind this curtain, we see what God is doing in and amongst ourselves and the church in the gospel. And if we're going to accept that from what it is, sometimes the world looks at that, and that's why they begin to look at the church and say, well, the church is anti-intellectual. It's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. And this, again, is not a new thing. And sometimes we have this tension within us when we begin to share the gospel and proclaim the gospel. And as we proclaim the gospel, people begin to question things. And we're just like, well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, this is kind of what it says. And all of a sudden, we feel like we have to have this better defense, this better articulated defense. We need to sound more like the world. We need to be more intellectual. 
But the, I'm going to quote an article that I was reading this week for you. I don't have it on the screen. You can just listen. It talks about this very issue. It says, the evangelical church has historically had a reputation for being anti-intellectual. Now, let's say you're an evangelical intellectual embarrassed by your heritage. You just might want to seat intellectual respectability, and that's what we try to do in the community a lot of times as the church. We try to go after intellectual respectability. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, he says, although you should consider the price. And you should also consider whether achieving intellectual respectability today, and here he's going to begin to bring in universities because he's talking about evangelical um, you could say universities, but he's talking about seminaries specifically in this as well, but he talks about universities. He says, when universities are loaded with tenured radicals of meager talent, would actually make you, or when you were thinking that universities loaded with tenured radicals of meager talent would actually make you a bona fide intellectual. He says, well, it appears that evangelical thinkers have now achieved respectability. That's the message today, symbolic and otherwise. Universities are now celebrating the opening of the evangelical mind. In his survey of evangelical institutions of higher learning, the author tells us that evangelical intellectuals who are infatuated with postmodernist thought are much given to non-judgmentalism and inclusion and are as insistent on multicultural diversity as any good leftist. The article goes on to say and to highlight how they're becoming squishy and soft in their theology, especially on the issue of homosexuality. Also, the author notes that seminaries, and he mentions one in particular, it's not important, but he mentions seminaries, are embarking on a course that would bring them closer to Freud than to Jonathan Edwards. He says, because of the church's desire to attain, to attain intellectual respectability through acceptance of what he calls the meager, this is what he says, talking about the universities. One is sentenced to an intellectual mediocrity, because they kept too many ideas out, and then conservative Christian institutions face the prospect of returning to mediocrity because they're letting too many ideas in. The title of this article, which was published by Oxford, is called Evangelicals Have Finally Made It Onto the Slippery Slope. This was written in 2001. So what's the slippery slope? It's thinking that affirming God's sovereignty in salvation is anti-intellectual. The slippery slope is seeing God's sovereignty as personally robbing you of something. The slippery slope is the violent act of robbing God of his holiness through being ashamed that the world rejects God's sovereignty in the gospel as we proclaim it. That's the slippery slope. And so when we look at Romans 8, verse 29 and 30, we stand on this precipice. And when you leave this precipice of simply proclaiming the gospel to all people as God has intended it, in the simple fan manner that it is, that sinners must be reconciled to God, and then believing that it's only God who opens the heart of those people, we're stewards of the message, God opens the heart of the people, just like he did with Lydia, Acts 16, verse 14, he says, the one who heard this woman named Lydia, and he goes on to say, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Whenever we leave this truth, this God-exalting, majestic truth, it's all downhill. It's all downhill. And you can go through church history, which we're going to do, shameless plug for our class coming up, and you can see every time the church has left this precipice, they have ended up in a place of disaster. And the same thing happens with us in our lives personally. So when a person, a church, evangelical movement, parachurch ministry, begins to call the sovereignty of God into question, it's simply calculated, I guess you could say, a countdown to the avalanche of disaster that's going to fall before them. And the reason they fall is because their view of God falls. That's the reason they begin to fall. They take God off of his throne, his high view of truth, high view of the gospel, high view of his son, and then when we begin to call into question his sovereignty, all of a sudden we call into question his truth, then we begin to call into question the gospel, and then we begin to call into question his son, and at best, at the end of this, 
we end up with Jesus as the guy who can make our life better, or at worst, we just deny God altogether, which is exactly what we see in the church today. And both of these are on the bottom of this slippery slope of destruction. So I want to remind you believers here this morning that God has for us a great expectation in these verses. And the great expectation he has in his verses is that we have an abiding security. And we think about our security in Christ, we look at the gospel, and we cling to that, but then we come to passages like this, and we're like, well, we want the security without this. But this is why the security is there. And so what I want to remind you this morning, that your security is there because of your ultimate purpose. And your purpose is that you're being conformed into the image of Christ by the delight of God, which is at the heart of what we're going to talk about this morning, giving you this abiding security because of your future glorification. And as we look at this this morning, the theology of these verses is at the summit of our understanding of Scripture. And God delights in salvation. And when we truly understand the gospel and we truly understand the vast implications of the gospel, we realize that we hold on to a great expectation of glory that is to come. And it is the security that we have that is an act of abiding security because of what God has done in us and through us. Because our future is rooted in the delight of God, not in your works, not that you've done something to earn his delight or his love, not that you've done anything for your salvation. It's rooted in the divine mind of God, and then it's executed and held by the Holy Spirit. This is what chapter 8's been all about. And so our salvation is founded and rooted in God's mind. Our church, Southside Church, is founded and rooted in the divine mind of God. And we look at the scriptures, and that's why we give praise to God, and we're like, from everlasting to everlasting, God is our refuge. This is what Moses said in Psalm 90. He says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. God, you are a refuge. God, you are a sanctuary. God, you are our stability in life. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is holy, and from everlasting to everlasting, he is God, and he will be God. So then when we understand that God is holy, we understand that he saves people, we begin to ask the question then, how can we live a significant, sanctified life, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in a sin-cursed world that looks at the gospel and says that's anti-intellectual? How are we supposed to live in a post-Christian culture? Well, I'll employ you like Peter does. He says, remember. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to remember together. We want to remember that God is and always has been our dwelling place as believers. We want to remember that our security is in him alone and what he's done. And so as we walk through this passage this morning... These are the things I want you to remember. I want you to remember who God is, and I want you to remember what God has done, and you're going to find that our purpose proves our security. And this is a great expectation that we live with and encourages us day in and day out as we live out the Christian life. So I'm going to read these two verses. Actually, I'll read three, 28 through 30, and then we're going to talk about these together. So if you would stand for our holy God. In reading and reflecting on his side of salvation. Starting in verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Father, we come to you this morning knowing that you are our refuge, knowing that you are from everlasting to everlasting. God, we proclaim your holy. God, we meditate on your holiness. But it's in moments like this, whenever we're confronted with the reality of the way in which you operate with humanity, humanity, 
that we truly begin to get a glimpse behind the curtain of your holiness. So God, I pray that you would help us today by your Spirit's power to understand, accept, and to love these truths. For your glory, not for our own, for our understanding, so that we can live in a way that's honorable to you, so that we can give praise and worship to you in a way that's honorable to you. We can't cry out holy, 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 and then make you what we want you to be, but we do. God, forgive us for doing that. Help us just to see you clearly for who you are this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we have three elements to our purpose this morning, and the first one is that we are conformed. And we're going to jump around a little bit, and the reason we're going to jump around a little bit is because this is the way Paul has this structured this morning. So he begins with his secondary purpose and then moves to his main purpose. So that's why he says, for those he foreknew, he also predestined. That's his secondary purpose. But his first purpose is to be conformed to the image of his son. So that's where we're going to begin. Our primary purpose is to be conformed. And what we begin to understand is that before time began, God sovereignly determined and called and saved believers so that they would represent him in the world. This is why he conforms us into his son's image. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment. One pastor put it this way, and I thought it was clever. He says, God is purpose-driven, and we as saints are purpose-given. And so he gives us this purpose. And this purpose is not ambiguous purpose. This isn't like, you know, the way in which people try to find themselves or say that they try to find truth, but they're just rejecting truth and trying to find their own truth. This isn't like a hunt to try to find out who you are, that kind of purpose. God is good. He gives good gifts to his children. He is patient. He is clear. That's the perspicuity of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture. And his purpose is clearly revealed in his word. And that's Ephesians 1.4, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And so that we are holy and blameless before him means that we're going to be conformed into his image and with his character, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors. So he wants us to be holy and blameless before him. He wants us to look like Christ so that we are his ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. So there's the gospel that's going out. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we understand what an ambassador is. An ambassador is an official of the highest rank, chosen and certified by a government to represent it before another. So you represent that government. You look, feel, taste, smell like that government. So people come in contact with you, then they know they've come in contact with that government. And so he's using this here and saying when people come in contact with you, they come in contact with God. So you're supposed to show them who God is in the world. We make... God visible to the world. That's what we do as believers and Christians. We are his love. We are his touch. We are his voice. We are his character. So that as the world looks at us, they're intrigued to know who God is. And so as God's ambassadors, we're called then. That's what he talks about in verse 28. Those who are, are called, God works everything together for good. In order that we first become like Christ so that we can then represent him in the world. So what is God doing then? He's recreating himself in us. This is the reconciliation that we have, is God now is just recreating himself in us. And so while he's recreating himself in us, he's making us like Christ, conformed to his image, and then also to represent God, the firstborn over all creation. So he's making us like Christ so that we can represent God. We are being conformed to his image. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We're going to one day be like Christ physically, So I'm not going to go into a lot of that. We talked about that in Romans 8, 23. We're going to have eternal, tangible bodies that are different in nature. But more what he's talking about here is that he's making us like Christ spiritually in that he's recreating Christ in us, in his character and all those things he's working out in us. We are being sanctified. That's what he's talking about here with the Holy Spirit. He's sanctifying us and setting us apart. And the reason he's doing this is so that we can be the firstborn over all creation. And when he talks about the fact that we are firstborn over all creation, he's talking about prominence and he's talking about preeminence. That's what he wants for us. That's the firstborn over all creation. Well, I'll say firstborn over all creation. Wrong verse. The firstborn among many brethren. You're like, is he reading the same Bible I am? I am. I'm getting there. So God's purpose, his chief purpose then in salvation is to glorify the Son by making him preeminent in the world. And so understanding that, believers then now have this position of honor. 
this position of prominence, this position of preeminence, but not for our own glory. But that's what we begin to do with salvation. We begin to look at salvation and begin to talk about things like I made a decision for Christ, that all these things, and then we take God's glorious plan of salvation, the fact that the angels are rejoicing, the fact that God is making his church, and Ephesians 3 says that as he's collecting his church and gathering his church, the Son is honored and glorified, these principalities and these angelic beings in this heavenly realm are giving God glory. We forget about all that, and we think about, but God saved me, and I want him to talk to me. I want the world to understand what he did for me, and we forget about all of these other things that's going on, and it's not for our glory. It's for his glory that we're saved. And so we have this preeminence in position. We have this privileged status among all creation, talking about humanity generally, as a whole first, and that we represent God. We have that position, but specifically, he's talking about what he says among the brothers. So now we have preeminence among many brothers. So God's design is for the church to represent what his original creation was intended to be. He created Adam and Eve, and they were supposed to honor him, glorify him, and obey him. And so now he brings together this church. He puts Christ at the head. And what does the church do? We honor him, we glorify him, and we obey him. That's what he's talking about is happening here. So now through Christ, the church is honoring and worshiping God in a right way. And he sets him up, Colossians 1.18, as the head of the body. So here's our first aspect of this ultimate purpose. And as to be a people that represents God, we by taking on his character of his son, And then as we take on his character of his son, we prove then that our security is secure because, point number two, it's God's delight to do this. And this is where we enter into what theologians call this golden chain. These verbs interlock together. They tie in together so tightly they cannot be broken. So some people call this the golden chain. But what I want you to understand this morning from these verbs that he's going to talk about, what God is doing, is that this is just God's delight. It's God's delight to do this. It's God's joy to do this. It's God's joy to make himself known in his children and to save them in a way in which we look at that and realize that God is holy, he is mighty, he is good, we have nothing to do with this, and we can do nothing but praise him and then realize that he does this for his own good pleasure. And we see God doing this for his own delight, first and foremost, in his foreknowledge. And that's what we come in contact with first. So we back up to the first part of verse 29. For those he foreknew, he also predestined. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this. He says, foreknowledge is the most important term of all five mentioned in the list because it is the first move in our direction. And it is determined and controlled by God. We're going to spend the most time on this one specifically this morning because this is the one that's under attack the most and this is where you stand, this is where you move off the precipice and begin to kind of move down this slippery slope. So I want to talk first this morning about what foreknowledge is not. It's always good to understand what's not. We can clear our minds and we can move into what it is. Foreknowledge, just so you know, has nothing to do with man. Has nothing to do with man. We try to make it be that it's nothing to do with man. And how we know this, first and foremost, is from basic hermeneutics. Hermeneutics are so important. And it's the hermeneutics that proves that you are not in this text. Let's read it and look at that together. For those for he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn of many brethren, that those whom he predestined, he also called, And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. He is God. So the passage is about God. It's not about us. And to bring ourselves into the text is maybe a word that you've heard of before. This is called eisegesis. Whenever you bring your own meaning into the text. Eisegesis means to literally to lead into. And so the interpreter then injects his own ideas to make it say what he feels like the text should say. And so you make a point 
at the expense of words, definitions, syntax, grammar, context, setting, authorial intent, all those things that are involved in hermeneutics. You make it at the expense of that. Exegesis, which is what our, whole, our church holds true to, which is what our desire, means literally to lead out of. So the interpretation of the interpreter comes from following the meaning of the text. So then you bring out the meaning of the text from precise definitions, syntax, grammar, context, setting, authorial intent. So we look at those things, and then that leads us to an understanding of the meaning. To say that you have anything to do with the foreknowledge of God is to perform what I would call hermeneutical assassination on this text, just in plain sight. Another reason we can say that it can be hermeneutical assassination is by looking at the pronouns. Look at the verse 29, the first part. For those whom he foreknew. Whom? Not what? You know, we begin to try to bring our own definitions in the text. We're going to talk about one of those in just a minute. But this is not what God foresaw. He didn't foresee something. He didn't foresee a decision. He saw a person. It's so important that we understand this. For whom he foreknew. Salvation is not initiated by the person's decision to receive Christ the Lord. God initiates salvation by his foreknowledge. Which is why I want to first explain that foreknowledge has nothing to do with man. And foreknowledge also has nothing to do with foresight. And this is like the classic argument against this that people begin. And if you were taught this, as I was taught this, or you believe this, I want to clear, clearly go through this before we get into what foreknowledge is this morning. Foreknowledge is not foresight. This is maybe the middle mind theory that you've heard of, where God looks down the corridor of time, and as he looks down the corridor of time, he sees that you choose him, so then he chooses you back, right? That's like middle school dodgeball. Like, you, you lay enough on the, time, on the team, right? And you're like, I want you on my team, I want you on my team, you on my team. Next time you're captain, you have to pick me, right? You pick me. I chose you, so you pick me, right? It's kind of like putting God in that kind of perspective. But that's not what this is. And so to interpret that in the idea that it is God looks down the corridor of time, then people go on to interpret predestined, called, justified, and glorified all as byproducts of you beginning to choose God. This cannot be true for a lot of reasons. We would spend the next three weeks on this, but we're going to spend just a couple this morning. First and foremost, because of his omniscience. If we say that God is omniscient, then we also affirm that God does not learn anything. So he's not sitting anywhere at any point in time, waiting to see what happens, waiting to learn something. God knows. He has total knowledge. He has the quality of knowing everything. That's what omniscience is. God does not react to humanity he doesn't sit anxiously waiting to see if he's worthy of someone's choosing or not. All that is is just simply a low view of God. So foresight is not true because we understand the omniscience of God. Foresight is not true also because we understand the human heart. And we've been talking about this in Romans as we've gone through Romans itself. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin... So death spread to all men because what? It was all sin. So we all sin. We're fallen. We're not partially fallen. We're not like a little candle flickering in the dark that someone just needs to like give a little effort to, right? You don't need to guard it. We're completely depraved. We're black as night. We don't learn how to sin. Looking at our children, right? They come out knowing how to sin. That's because of the depravity in their heart. Sin is past, what Scripture says, even this passage, from the seed to man to the woman. So that whenever God interacts with, in our life with us, Ephesians 2, 1, he finds us where? Dead in our trespasses and sins. He doesn't find us flickering in our trespasses and sins. He doesn't find us almost alive in our trespasses and sins. He says he finds us dead, spiritually dead. That's where God finds us. And that's why Paul spends all this time in Romans 3, Starting in verse 9 or verse 10, he says, none is righteous, not one. It covers everybody, mathematically, right, Matt? Not one. No one understands. No one sees God. All have turned aside. Everyone is worthless, does not do good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps, 
They're full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Their paths are ruined to misery. The way of peace they've not known. They have no fear of God before their eyes. Depravity. Totally depraved. So here's my point. Foreknowledge cannot mean foresight because if God, taking this into account, would sit on the edge of his seat and simply wait for mankind, all he would do is watch them not choose him because they can't, because they're dead in their trespasses and sins. That's why foresight cannot be. John 6, no one can come to me. That's why Jesus says this. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I'll raise him up in the last day. The only way for any of us to be saved if it God himself takes our deadness and then makes us alive, Ephesians 2, 4, 9. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, did what? Made us alive together with Christ. So that, verse 7, in the coming ages, we might show the immeasurable riches of the kindness of us towards Christ Jesus for his own glory. So he makes us alive together in him for his own glory and for this greater purpose. So now let's understand what foreknowledge is, understanding what foreknowledge is not. When you look at the word foreknowledge, at its root, it has this word gnosko, which means to know, and then this prefix pro or for. And at the heart of this is a beautiful thing. At the heart of this to know is talking about a love. It's talking about an intimacy. The same word is used in Scripture to talk about the sexual intimacy between a man and a woman. It's talking about a special intimacy that belongs to them. And God says, I know you. There's a special intimacy that belongs between you and me. And it means to love intimately. This is why Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is what God's saying through the prophet. I knew you. We had an intimate relationship. The scriptures say that he knit us together in our mother's womb. He knows us intimately and that he loves for us. We're an object of his love. This is why the word the prophet Amos used whenever he says of the God to Israel, Amos 3, 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. God foreknew the nation of Israel. God knew the nation of Israel intimately, in spite of them, by the way, not because of them. And he loved them, and he chose to set his gaze upon them, not because of their great number, Deuteronomy says. He chose to do this because he wanted these people to be his ambassadors, so he set a gaze upon them, and he decided to know them and to love them, and so he raised this nation up to represent him. Those who God does not know, God says, depart from me, from my presence. Why does he say, depart from me? Because he says, I never knew you. Same word. I never knew you, Matthew 7. And I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's not that God doesn't know about them. Omniscience. He knows who they are. He knows that they're sinners. He knows that they reject him. He knows all those things. He understands those things. But he's saying there is, I don't entrust myself to them. This is what John 2 is all about. He started the wedding at Cana, and then he did the first cleansing of the temple. And after the first cleansing of the temple, he says, you destroy it, I'll raise it up. He performed a lot of other miracles. And then in John 2, 24, Jesus says, I was not entrusting myself to them. I did not know them. I wasn't allowing them to know me in this way. Jesus wasn't sharing his love with them. So foreknowledge means to love intimately. That's what it means but then it also carries, that's the first aspect of it, it also carries this idea of ultimate purpose behind it too. So God's love is a choice love that's given to those who he has set aside now for a specific purpose, Acts 2, 23. That Jesus delivered up, well, this is an example of God's foreknowledge in Christ himself. Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan of God and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So God had foreknowledge of Christ's death, of Christ's sacrifice. He foreordained Christ to die at the hand of sinners for sinners. So Peter affirms the same truth, Peter 1.20, 1 Peter 1.20, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. And then Peter talks about believers then in the same way. In 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, to those who are elect according to what? The foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience in Jesus Christ for the sprinkling 
with his blood. So believers then are considered to have foreknowledge, have this predetermined love of God on them with purpose in the same way Christ was foreknown. This isn't foreseeing. This is a predetermined choice by God, planned by God, specifically for his love to be on display for the world. This is why we can read passages like Matthew 16 whenever he says, the gates of hell will not persevere against my church. Why? Because God already has foreknowledge, has foreordained these things to happen. I've determined to love these people. They are going to love me. I'm going to use them to represent me in the world. The gates of hell can't come against that because I'm the creator God of everything that you see in the universe. And if you're God's child, you can't fall away. It's not that you won't fall away. You can't fall away. So what shall we say then? Going back to Romans 8, verse 31, which we're going to be getting to next time. Well, time after next. Too many things. What then shall we say? If God's for us, who can be against us? Right? This is why Paul is saying this. Because it understands God's role in salvation in his life. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Will he not also graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who's going to condemn? Who shall separate us? Verse 35. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The gates of hell cannot persevere against the church. You cannot fall away from God's salvation because of he foreknew you. And God delights in his foreknowledge. He also delights in his predestination. He loves us in a very specific, distinguished way. That's his foreknowledge. And then he also then delights in his predestination. So God then moves from looking at purpose in eternity with this past foreknowledge to illuminating us then of this future purpose in predestination. And at the, the root of this word predestination is the word horizo, which means horizon. So it's something that you can see. And then he used the prefix for. So it's like before the horizon. So you have these boundaries from horizon to horizon. Literally means to set the boundaries beforehand. So you can see like it's talking about setting a, a purpose beforehand. So before the world began, God marked out his boundaries. He set the horizon for all those who foreknow him and he would believe, they would believe. So what is the boundary? What is the purpose? What is the, what is the set? What is the thing that he set? He goes, well, I predestined them to be conformed into the image of his son. So that's why at conversion, the spirit begins to sanctify us and move in us to conform us into the image of Christ because this is our purpose in life, him recreating Christ in us. So before the world began, God's purpose for his life, God's predetermined destiny, if you want to see it that way, is that you become like Jesus. And as we become like Jesus, we then represent him in the world and we fulfill our purpose. This is why we look at Christ himself. Christ would not have been handed over to be crucified if this were not also God's predetermined plan. Acts 4.27, truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus who you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the priests of Israel, to do what? To do whatever your hand, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. This was Christ's destiny. We have a destiny to be like Christ. Christ had a destiny to be according to the plan of God. And so now we understand from horizon from horizon, from eternity past to eternity future, God foreknew us. He predestined us to be conformed into the image of his son from now all the way into eternity. If you want to read in your devotion this week, read Ephesians 1. It's peppered all through there so that you understand that truth. And this is why we get to 1 John 3, 2. It says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that what, when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. God wants us to be like him in every single way, just short of his divinity, sharing in his love, sharing in his glory, sharing in his inheritance. This is why you look at someone's life and they say, no, I'm a Christian. No, I'm a believer. And then you look at their life and you're like, where's the fruits of the Spirit? They're like, why don't you look like Christ? It's impossible to say that you're saved 
without becoming like Christ. Why? Because this is what God has predestined for believers. It has to happen. If you do not see it in your life, then you're not a believer of God because God's not going to say, I think I'll save someone, but this one I'm just going to let go. That doesn't make any sense. No, he has this predetermined plan for us that we'd be like Christ. So we look at our life, and then we give praise to God, right? As we have successes over sin, as we overcome sin in our life, we can praise to God because he's working out his will in our life. It confirms our salvation. It affirms God's love for us. And we can say, I'm going to continue to succeed because of what God is doing, not because of what I'm doing. It's an amazing truth to begin to realize. So if a person claims to be a Christian, he's not looking like Christ. They're just not who they claim to be because God has predestined us. Do you see why Christianity is not all about a decision that you made for Jesus? Do you see how this kind of, that mindset kind of gives an affront to the holiness of God whenever we begin to see what God is doing in our midst of our life and salvation? God delights in salvation. He's about accomplishing his will in us so that his glory is on display. He delights in converting you. He delights in loving you. He delights in watching you being conformed into the image of his son. He delights in it for your good. He delights in it because you represent him in the world. He delights in it as he puts you in a church, and then that church is the proof that God exists, John says. He delights in all those things. He glories in all those things. And he delights, the scriptures say, in his own glory. So he's going to continue to move in this way in your life. So God delights in his foreknowledge. He delights in his predetermined destiny. And that's why then he begins to take much delight in his calling. And this is where we begin to intersect with an eternal God, this calling of God. Whenever the gospel goes out, kaleo, it means to call out and to summon to. That's kind of what the word is talking about there when he says they've called. And we have two calls of God that goes out. We have this outward call, this one outward call, which is the gospel, we go out and proclaim the gospel. You go meet somebody for coffee. You meet someone in your neighborhood. Meet them before you the church. You're talking to them about the gospel. You're proclaiming the gospel. You're calling them to repentance through the gospel. That's the first outward call. And this is God's divine plan since the beginning of time. Romans 10, 14. How are they calling him who then not believed? And how are they going to believe in him who you have not ever heard? And how are they going to hear without someone preaching? So we take the gospel into the world. This is God's, again, God's divine will. He's like, I've decided to do this thing, and the way I'm going to do it is the gospel's going to go out. But while the gospel's going out, I'm going to be working in the hearts of the people. So I want my people to be obedient and proclaiming the gospel, and while they're obedient and proclaiming the gospel, I'm going to begin to work in the hearts of the people to turn to me in repentance and faith. And so that's why the Bible tells us, before we even hear the gospel, God's already doing a work inside of our hearts to respond to that outward call. This is 2 Timothy 1, 9. He saved us and called us, what? To a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and because of his own grace, which he gave us in Christ, when? Before the ages began. So those who are called inwardly are those whose heart the Spirit is beginning to stir up to lead them to saving faith. This is why Jesus says in John 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, because he already knew them. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and what do they do then? They follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, because I and the Father then are one. And so then we hear this call, and this is where we begin to understand the gospel, understand our sin, look at who God is. So wherever in life you first heard the call of God, you begin to understand your sinfulness, understand the chasm between you and God, that you need to be reconciled to him. All of that happens only by the gospel going out still, by the way. But we don't realize at that moment, you can't. You can't realize at that moment that what's happening inside of you began before the world began. You can't know that. And so this is why one of, this is one of the first ideas in theology that people begin to wrestle with. It's because once they're saved, then they begin to read the Bible and look and see things, and they're like, wait a minute. 
wait a minute, what's that mean? What's that? How does that apply to my life? And then you begin to be like, oh my goodness, I had no idea what God was doing. I had no idea this is how he worked in my life. And so we begin to respond to that call. And then we begin to realize who we are. And what begins to happen then is this, at least it was in my own life too, this wonderful discovery as we read the scripture on the holiness of God and the love of God and to understand what he's been doing in my life since before I even understood the gospel. Knowing that he's been coming after me, knowing that he has loved me, he foreknew me, and at that moment predestined me so that I would then become conformed into the image of his son. This is the security that Paul is drawing our attention to in this section of scripture. He's like, this is why you're secure. This is why you're going to be glorified, because God is doing these things in you. But if you reject the call, you're not going to be part of his kingdom. And we're going to talk more about that in in the weeks to come because we are hitting Romans 9. And when you get to Romans 9, Jacob of a love, Esau of a hated, like there's some things in there that we're just going to have to go through together. There's some difficult things in Scripture. Praise God that there is because there is a God who is holy, who is greater and mightier than us that we need to begin to understand. But is God's delight to call those whom he predestined and he foreknew? And it's also God's the light to justify them. Just like with the other aspects of God's saving work, this is God's exclusive work that he does in us. God makes us right with himself. We talked about this when we started Romans, right? All the way back in chapter one, where the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. We we talked about what justification is. We talked about how it's this word picture of God's holiness and how the scales are unbalanced. And we can do anything we want to do, but we're never going to balance the scales of God's righteousness because of our depravity. And the only way that the scales are balanced so that we can be reconciled with God is if God himself does it. So he puts Christ, he puts himself on the other side. So then the scales are balanced. So now that we know by repentance and faith that we can be justified to God, made right with God, the penalty of sin taken care of, all of that stuff by God himself. We're granted then this pure righteousness of God. So how do you know if you've been justified? Well, you begin to see your life conformed into the image of Christ. We bear what Matthew says, the fruit of repentance. We begin to take on the characteristics of Christ because, again, Christ has recreated himself in you. So if you're a believer and you're here today and you're being conformed into the image of Christ, it's because God delighted to save you. And then now he's holding you to be glorified. This is the third point, the last section of verse 30. Those he justified, he also glorified. And we covered this also previously, what glorification is. We talked about this in the beginning of the future glory in verse 18. But what I love about this is it's past tense. If you notice, all these are. He foreknew, predestined, justified, glorified, all past tense. All things that are done in God's mind. It's completely finished. Again, our security in him. All of it past tense. This is why Paul told the Thessalonians that glorification then is our ultimate purpose in salvation in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. To this he called you through our gospel, there goes the call goes out, so that you may be obtained, you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the purpose, that we may attain the glory of God. So what do we do with all of this? How do we take this practically and put this into motion? in our lives. You just live out your purpose. That's what you do. How do you do that? You call people to salvation. You grow in the truth of the gospel. You understand his word. You repent of sin. You'll be obedient in faith. And as you do those things, we have this glorious inheritance that's awaiting us. And it's an inexplicable inheritance. It's an unimaginable inheritance. And it has benefits that are vast. And many times whenever the scripture speaks of it, it just uses plural terms. There's all of these benefits that we can't even fully understand right now. And at the center of that glory is going to be the Son. And as we capture His gaze, He gazes upon us. We see the beauty of the Lord, Psalm 27 says. And as we think right now about that coming time of glory, 
We, we think about the beauty of God, his glorious nature, his grace. We think about his divine love, his free gift of life. And then we simply live in a way that reflects that beauty. We live in a way that where we represent God as his ambassadors. We live in a way that's worthy of this great inheritance that we have. And so we gaze upon his beauty, and then this drives us to live in a way to where the world then looks at us and asks us, why do you have hope? Where does that come from? And then we serve our ultimate purpose, and we tell them of a God who delights in saving people. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your plan of redemption. Thank you that it's not determined on the fickleness of man. Thank you that your love is predetermined, that your purpose is predetermined. Thank you that you can accomplish what we cannot. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this. What a humbling state we stand in before you this morning. There's none of us here that have done anything to deserve or capture Father, your gaze, your love, your goodness, Father, nothing. So we give thanks to you for that. We pray, God, this morning that you begin to help us to understand this so that we can just give you praise and honor and glory that you deserve. Father, so we fall on our knees and we worship you for being a God of love, truly, truly love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.